We are doing a workshop series called Farming Through Wildfire Season. I'm Katie Brim, and who you just heard speaking is Natalia Pinzon. Um, she's, you can see her on the, the webinar. We are co-founders of Farmer Campus, which is an online learning platform for farmers and ranchers, helping you to navigate unprecedented barriers to farming through targeted multimedia education. Um, and again, this workshop is part of a series of um, farming through wildfire season, but we're going to get into the basics of um, on-farm wildfire preparedness. So you can go to the camera slide, the quote slide, Natalia. Yeah, so obviously wildfire is a huge topic. It can, I'm sure everyone has different feelings around it. And I just wanted to share this quote that I love from Robin Wall Kimmerer, just to remind you that, um, you know, this is, we're dealing with wildfire. A lot of people have trauma here. It can be overwhelming, but it can also be a force of creation and something that's regenerative. And I just wanna remind that to everybody. And also our goal of this session is first and foremost to help you feel empowered and see how fire is, is both a tool and a regenerative force, but also to really see how you as farmers um, or people serving farmers can be critical to wildfire resilience statewide, countrywide. Um, and we really want you to walk away from this morning with important resources, having heard real stories of recovery and preparedness by other farmers. Uh, so we'll have Be Well Farm on here in a little bit. And we want to send you into this summer with an action plan and practical ways that you can start, pre start preparing your farm right away. And just want to remind you, of course, we can't cover all of wildfire resilience in one session. And so we invite you to join us throughout the next year as we dig into this topic. Today, we're just getting into preparedness, but there's a robust amount of knowledge to know for true resilience. And um, we also offer an online course, which goes deeper into all of these topics. Um, so you can go to the outline side. So again, yeah, we're gonna be take this little by little, bite by bite, and we're here like throughout the whole thing, um, the whole next year, you can um, turn to us as you work through your own preparedness. So Farmer Campus, we're an online learning platform and we have been working in the last four years to really support farmers through wildfire resi resilience. And so we're doing this in multiple levels. We do research through universities to really understand the needs of farmers and um, ag professionals in understanding wildfire and what your needs are. Um, we also help with disaster response and resilience uh, through different community partners. Um, and then our core work is really online and in-person education. So you can go to the next slide. So the education branch of Farmer Campus and our wildfire resilience consists of a robust and engaging online course, which is free to farmers and ranchers. And I'll share that with you in a little bit. And it's definitely something to check on, out because we really go into depth there. It includes a whole network. Um, so you'll meet other farmers and you'll have mentors and you can meet more people who are working in this topic. We also have videos and podcasts created by experts and farmers alike. So we share farmer stories of how they've been impacted and how they were colored through our podcasts, um, through blogs. And then we also have a partnership through CAF, which I'll go into in a second. And we host in-person town halls regionally throughout California. So keep an eye out for that. So those are in person to um, hear more resources around your specific community. And then uh, that we have a robust online library of wildfire related resources around insurance, financial aid, et cetera. So um, we'll, you'll hear more about that in a second as well. And the way that we really get this work done, we've um, been able to reach a lot of farmers in the last few years, as well as community partners and other experts working in this field. And the way we really deepen our impact is by having really great partners. And one of those for us has been Community Alliance for Family Farms. And I wanted to invite Amber, the new head of their Wildfire Resilience Program, to share a little bit about that work. And this is really for you all to know who to turn to um, as you dig into this, these topics on your farm. So go ahead, Amber. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Katie. That was a lovely introduction. Yeah, so my name is Amber, and I am the new Wildfire Resilience Specialist with CAF. This is an area of work that they've been sort of formally in since 2017 with the Tubbs Fire in Sonoma County. but Obviously the, the need is growing. And so um, we finally found some funding. And so I just started in February and we just launched our wildfire landing page. So please check that out. I think we're gonna link it in some of these. But anyway, um, basically we're just looking at different ways, you know, using farmer voices to fill some of these gaps about preparedness, response and recovery needs. So 
we all kind of know, right, um, a little bit about the uh, oncoming issues of like how to identify and develop and deliver some of these um, specialized recovery and preparedness resources. So that's why we're working with Farm Farmer Campus who has that technical expertise and they're doing a really good job and this is a perfect example of it. So um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide, please. I don't know, there we go, awesome. Um, so I'd like to just like take a step back and just ask what does that mean on farm resilience for farmers? So we often know that farms are serving as a buffer between big wildfires because they're in areas that are next to high population density, but on the out outskirts, sometimes it's called the WUI, right? The wildland urban interface. And so by helping farmers, we're actually helping all of the community, right? There's co-benefits for, for really putting some of that energy into protecting those areas. Um, also, it's relying on the idea of like stack practices, like implementing methods like structure hardening in conjunction with other, other uh, practices like prescribed burning or uh, livestock grazing, right? To reduce fuel loads. And then pairing that with building the capacity of community partners to respond to emergencies. And that is helping everybody, right? Reduce overall damages and recovery efforts are often quicker or more, more effective. Um, and it's also really uh, founded on this idea of multi-way sharing of knowledge and resources to address those impacts. So that's you know looking at the gaps, preparing for future disasters, and also just testing new ideas. Um, next slide, please. Awesome. So how are we doing it? There's lots of ways to get involved. Um, obviously, y'all already know about Farmer Campus, which is a great entry point. Um, so we do have a resource library that we host um, through the CAF website, and that's got a bunch of different materials. Um, you know, it can get really detailed and you can look at the grazing uh, programs and prescribe burn training information, things like that. Or you can kind of just like get a higher level um, in information and just browse the different uh, options that are there. If you want to get even more involved, we are starting a statewide wildfire and agriculture stakeholder group. So that's basically anyone who's interested in that intersection between wildfire and agriculture. Um, we want to get those folks connected and sharing information. Right now, it's just through a, a very loose Google group, but we'll see where that goes in the future. So if you, if you have questions about that and you want to maybe get involved, let, let me know. You can just shoot me an email. Um, we're starting a forum for kind of like what are the common questions that people have, you know, and sort of being able to like upvote answers to different things. So if you want to help us start that, that's also on our, our landing page. We have a wildfire funding program as well that's going to start launching this June. Um, and that's like 5K mini wards to folks who have been impacted in the 18 priority counties in uh, 2020 fires. And then also um, just trying to help folks understand what other types of financial aid are out there for them that are external to CAF, but still um, stuff that we can help them navigate through. And also we have a new mailing list. So if you want wildfire specific information from CAF, you can just sign up for that mailing list. And I think my info is right there on the slides. So that's basically it from me. If you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or just email me. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. And just I'm really uh, honored to have her here this morning and she'll be chiming in. So feel free to ask us all questions throughout. Um, and I will share all of the links to the resources she just started or she just mentioned in a follow up email. So now we're going to turn to Natalia, who's going to set the stage for today's uh, workshop around the context of agriculture at the nexus of wildfire and how farmers really can be critical in doing preparedness. Uh, efforts. So go ahead, Natalia. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalia. And as Kitty said, we're going to look at how agriculture fits into the larger challenge of wildfires. Before doing that, I really want to briefly share how wildfires are a cultural problem. As you know by now, we are in a wildfire ecology in California, and fire has been happening on these lands for millions of years. The vegetation in the Mediterranean climates are adapted to burn periodically here. And our plant species are adapted to wildfires. And native people understood this. They lived in relationship to fires. They used it to encourage growth and to support their food ways. So they had these frequent low intensity wildfires and not had, continued to have, and reduced, um, which reduced future high intensity fires. This is why now in California, we're finally accepting cultural burning and prescribed burning as a tool to reduce fire risk after nearly 100 years of fire suppression. Unfortunately though, fires and fuels are growing faster than we can really treat them. 
And European forest managers in the 19th and 20th century really saw fire as an enemy. So years of colonization brought a nearly global suppression of cultural burning. And it also brought the enclosure of the commons where land that was managed in common gets divided and privatized. Which brings us to now where we have over 12 million acres of private land that is more difficult to manage. What was before forest managed for the common good becomes private responsibility. With 30 million acres of California forest land, 40% of it is currently privately owned and managed. In fact, 20% of all California forests is family owned and not industrial. And if you can imagine, 90% of that are tiny parcels, oh, smaller than 50 acres. These are really small parcels when you think about resources for fuel load management. So we have about 200,000 family owned parcels on 7 million acres. And we need to bring private landowners to manage um, these, the fuel load in those forests. So while farmers are only a portion of these landowners, many farmers really do manage uh, a portion of forests, especially those farming at the wildland urban interface, which is where we have the greatest wildfire risk. And so what's the role of farmers and ranchers? They play a critical, we play a critical, critical role in wildland fire management and recovery, beginning with the most obvious prescribed burning, excuse me, prescribed grazing and targeted grazing of sheep, goats, and cattle for fuel load reduction of grasses and shrubs, which is becoming every day more accepted as after decades of skepticism and pushback. And then added benefit to this prescribed grazing is that the proper management and delicate timing of livestock in our brittle ecosystem can actually benefit the land through nutrient cycling and invasive species management. And it might surprise you how ranchers used to burn rangelands to reduce fire hazards and improve grazing for livestock and wildlife. When it was historically permitted, we had upwards of 200,000 acres that were burned by ranchers in a given year. So fire really used to be a tool that was frequently used by various communities that lived within the fire dependent ecosystems that we're in. And we have a long way to go to come back to that. Um, agriculture really provides as well a buffer at the wildland urban interface or the WUI, especially ecological, ec ecologically managed farms, which have high soil organic matter in their soils and they replenish their groundwater. These farms are able to provide a buffer against the wildfires for their residential neighbors. We've seen that in the fires that we've had in the last five years. Fields, vineyards, and graze landscapes can serve as strategic fire breaks, which can slow or stop the progress of a wildfire. And we've even seen in the research where multiple European studies have found that agricultural abandonment in, Medi in the Mediterranean region is one of the biggest drivers of wildfire. As farmlands are abandoned and the land is no longer managed, the species that grow provide a high fuel load. And coming back here to California, the farmland abandonment is real. It's really prevalent. Agricultural land is continuously threatened by development pressure, and by the global financialization of agriculture. So as we lose farmlands, we lose that important wildfire buffer and the ecosystem services that they provide. So there's some models, instead of planning and designing our development, um, we, can, we can instead plan and design our development to integrate agriculture, to help us coexist with wildfire ecosystems. In the top image, you can see how diffuse spacing of homes requires a greater zone of defense that's more firefighting resources and more clearing of native vegetation. Whereas on the bottom, if you cluster homes with more agricultural land surrounding it, it provides a protective buffer, making the community easier to defend and requiring fewer resources. But, and it also provides this rich cultural community and health benefits of local food systems because the surrounding farms are feeding those communities that they're enveloping. But unfortunately, um, the world over, farmland is really declining. The US has seen a massive loss of farmlands, especially medium and small sized farms, which could serve as buffers at the wildland urban interface. And development is all, often at the wildland urban interface as people wanna live closer to pro in proximity to wildlands. So to conclude, I really just want to emphasize how much we believe that agriculture is fundamental in addressing the issue of wildfires. Farmers and ranchers manage forests, they manage fuel, fuel breaks, they provide buffers and replenish the ecosystems that are impacted by wildfire. 
and family farmers provide the social capital and the jobs to revitalize a rural economy after wildfire. We've seen how farmers are really critical to the social fabric that's needed to support rural communities during wildfire disaster. For example, mutual aid, emergency response and recovery. People really have looked to farmers in their networks as community leaders in recovery. That's why in our work, we believe that it's so urgent to support family farmers in wildfire adaptation. And you all probably agree and know this, um, but I hope this gives you some fodder to think about the role of farmers in wildfire preparedness. And with that, I think Katie's gonna lead us through some breakout rooms. Thank you, Natalia. So great. We always kind of do this little sneaky quick share and, and have um, breakout rooms so that you all can meet each other and hear each other's voices. Uh, we know you all have a lot to, um, to teach one another. So Natalia is going to put us into some quick breakout rooms. This will just be, um, let's see, about five minutes. So the questions to prompt you is how have you experienced wildfire in your region? And then what have you done so far to get prepared and or how are you adapting? So that's just to prompt you and then to get the conversation going, please make sure everybody has a chance to share and then choose one person to bring back any key takeaways. Uh, Natalia, let me know when you're ready. I'm almost ready. Great, so you'll be in these, these for about five minutes. We'll come back, you'll do about a five minute share and then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the of basics of preparedness and then we'll be hearing from the well farms. Okay. And I will, I'll put these prompts in our chat too once you're in your breakout rooms. Is that everybody back? There's a couple of people. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope that was, I know that was quick, but um, hopefully you got a little chance to see who else was in the room. Um, could one person from each group just really quickly share back like a key takeaway? I'll pop in and go first for my group. Um, so we had two folks who are in urban areas and so they weren't quite sure, you know, that this is like an overview of how, how does that really apply some of these concepts to urban areas. So we talked a little bit about how to mitigate like smoke and uh, toxic ash through compost use and that sort of thing. But also just talking about how to support the other folks that are in the WUI or the other rural areas with preparedness. And it sounds like a lot of folks are doing little pieces even if it's just like, you know, um, maintenance around their properties and those zones and that it sounds like defensible space was something that helped save people from a lot of uh, extra damage, especially in Sonoma County. And I think it was Karen. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll have to talk more later about how all that affects urban folks too. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, interesting. Um, depending on where you are, this, is, this um, type of preparedness will affect you in different ways. So um, definitely you can cherry pick what's, what is relevant for you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Tiana. I was in the breakout room to I'll share for us. I think um, there are a few of us. I think Ben is the only person who didn't get a chance to share. We ran out of time. Um, but mm, I think the takeaways for us was that um, uh, community is really important and the role of, of community, so such as the Firewise programs, um, developing that, um, as Aaron from Molokai said, community uh, communication and trust, ongoing education within those groups really helps skill everyone up and um, share uh, share resources and the load. Um, Zach is from Cobb Fire, and he was talking about how, again, those fire waste programs have helped. And so um, uh, CJ was, um, it works for a non for profit that is supporting um, ranchers and farmers in New Mexico uh, with soil health research and the kind of the practical applications of that. So sort of all over the board, um, what it means to be in a community and how we can sort of um, assist each other. I think was a takeaway from ours. Thank you, Diana. Diana, that was great. So many really great points. I think community resilience has really been such an important factor and it's been amazing to watch different communities really evolve over the last five, six years as we've had increasing wildfires, get more sophisticated, support each other and really drive even policy change. So we really need everyone. I think no matter where you're coming from, um, you have something to offer because we, we're all impacted by 
um, either directly by wildfires or all the other indirect effects. So thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Yeah, my name is Mitch. We were in breakout room one. And I don't know how you guys did it. We didn't, we didn't get much further than how y'all, where are you from? Um, <laughs> but we did talk a little bit about about resources to go and, uh, you know, and help uh, help pay, pay for, uh, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, fire break stuff like NRCS and, uh, and uh, you know, how it's kind of affecting us and the, the challenges we have on support and cost. Thank you, Mitch, for sharing that. It sounds like you did get into some good topics. It's good at least to know who else is out there doing this work and how they're engaging with it. Um, is there any, another breakout room they wanted to share? Is there one more? Maybe not. It might have been it. Okay, great. Thank you all for being brave and sharing. Um, super helpful. And it's really great to hear who's in the room and, and what, how you're thinking about this. Um, and we want to be able to, to really hear from you. And then we're going to share how we're thinking about preparedness. And then we're going to go to Be Well Farms to share how they've gone through their own emergency planning. Um, so Natalia, we can go back to... And if you wouldn't mind also putting in the chat our workbook. So for those of you um, who joined a little bit later, um, look into the chat in a second. Natalia is going to put a link that will take you to our wildfires page where you can download our workbook. Uh, this is something that's a draft at the moment. So it's uh, um, right now it's more of a wildfire resilience plan template. We're going to be publishing publishing this at the end of the year as a more robust book that's going to feature case studies and chapters from different contributors, um, and it'll be more robust. But for now, this is actually really great for a basics class, and we're going to be walking through you through how to use this um, on your own farm. Um, so stay tuned for the next version, but we wanted to share this one for you now because it's going to be super helpful for you this spring. Um, so download that when you have a second and open it up for this section. Um, as you can see on the slide, I'm going to give you just a brief rundown of what basic preparedness can look like on your farm. And it's going to look different depending on your operation, of course. But these are some just really key things that if you just get to this, uh, you'll be in a really good spot. Um, so first of all, um, go, go ahead and go next. Okay, so one of the first components in preparedness is having a farm map, and this can help you assess and reduce your risk. So this is a great first step, um, is just to create a farm or a ranch map, um, or even if you're in an urban area, you could just even do your household and whatever land you're on. Um, this is on page three of the workbook for those of you who've downloaded it. Um, so you're gonna wanna put a clear indication of where your water sources are located, location of livestock if you have them, um, any main buildings, structures, um, off buildings, your machinery, your equipment, electrical gas and water shut offs. It's also good to include needed supplies such as sandbags, fire extinguishers, gas power generators, hand tools, primary and secondary areas to relocate your farm assets and your workers. Um, and so this is really great to do ahead of time before you're in any type of emergency and actually share it with your local um, fire department. You can even invite them out to your property and they can see where all of these things are. And that can really help reduce um, risk later because they can be very quickly, they can very quickly um, help you out if you're in an emergency by knowing where the water is and knowing how to, you know, where flammable materials, that type of thing. Um, so this is a really, it can be fun, it can be super detailed, or it can be um, whatever you can. But I think doing this at the first step is a great um, way to help fire, uh, the fire department help you. So then next. So next, you'll see on page four of the workbook, um, there's risk and vulnerability assessments. And these are super important for you to understand really what your risk is and how much you have to do, as well as what to prioritize. And there's two different types of assessments in the workbook. There's a rapid one, and then there's a comprehensive self-assessment. The rapid one is really for you to just get a quick like um, overview, bird's eye view of what um, your risk is. And then the self-assessment is gonna take you through every single aspect of your um, operation and make sure that you're prepared. So that one's pretty overwhelming. So it's good to start with this one just to get an idea of where you stand. 
So we really say uh, this spring in particular, start with a rapid assessment and you're gonna evaluate address four core aspects. And that's gonna be your background risk factors like your fuel load and your slope. Um, as well as your defensible space, which is the buffer you create between a building on your property and the grass and trees and shrubs and any wildland area that's around it, um, which reduces the chance of your infrastructure catching fire. And then you're gonna look at your structure hardening as well as your emergency access points. And then after you've done that and done the assessment of those four core aspects, we recommend going into the comprehensive self-assessment. Um, and just so you know, we're going to cover some of this in future webinars, but you can also go into our online course for support where we actually have video tutorials on how to best use these and explains kind of how you're what the ratings mean and how to go through them. <laughs> and there's a link in the chat now for the course um, that you can register for it. And then again, it's free and it has resources and tutorials around all of these activities. So next. Um, the, to increase your response capacity when a wildfire um, strikes, we recommend way ahead of time getting in place uh, your disaster preparedness plans. And we've broken these down into three ma main plans. Um, and the most important component of this is to not only get these plans together, but to actually practice these. And these are critical increasing your capacity to respond quickly and effectively when the disaster does strike, um, which can reduce your risk when done well. So the first, the first plan is your communications plan. So this is gonna include your home, your farm, and your crew. And you're gonna to wanna to create a plan with all of your family members, your crew, and your neighbors, as well as backup support. You'll establish an emergency communications protocol, including an out of area contact, because a lot of times local phone lines will go down, um, as well as getting communication equipment, such as two-way radios, walkie-talkies, or a megaphone, as well as establishing a safe place to meet outside of the disaster area. So thinking way outside your region to make sure you have a safe place to go and that that's communicated to everyone. Um, and then it seems basic, but making sure you have important phone numbers and place them in an accessible, clear area for everyone to see and really know that your crew have, is up to date on all of that information. Um, your second plan, and I still love this little um, um, emoji I made with putting the sheep in the back of the truck because I have actually seen people with their sheep in their cars evacuating from fires. Um, so it's the ability to evacuate your farm during and for emergency responders coming in um, and help them identify and safely access your property. Um, during an evacuation is really critical. So you wanna make sure you have at least two or more roads in and out of your property, as well as open all your gates during an emergency. Um, you need to have two evacuation routes for your whole farm to know just in case one of them is blocked and then have an agreed upon meetup place for once you're evacuated. Um, you're gonna create and delegate tasks for evacuating people and your livestock off your property or to a hardened off pasture. And we're gonna actually see that um, through Be Wells Farm as well in a second here. Um, so, and as well as make sure, I think everyone knows this now, but have your go bags stocked and ready to find and in an easy to find location. I usually have them in a closet near my door or I just keep them in my car. Um, finally, your shelter in place, this is on page 25. Um, and sorry, your, the evacuations and the communications plans on page 17 and the evacuation plan is on page 22. So shelter in place. So this is what happens if you just can't get out and community responders have told you they can't actually make it to you. And this is a really scary situation that we don't want any of you to be in, but in case you are, it's good to make a plan to choose a room um, or a neighbor's place next door where you have supplies stocked for a few days if this is your only option is to stay and fight the fire or at least shelter in place until the responders can get to you. Next one. Okay, so I know that was a bit of rapid fire. Um, your action plan, um, you're probably feeling a little overwhelmed. And so this is where you just choose a few high priorities. So you'll go from the assessments that you have done, um, choose a few high priority things that you think you can tackle right away, and then just make a plan for what you're gonna tackle this spring. So you'll ask yourself what needs to be done, how you'll do it, planning for your costs, and give yourself a deadline. So those are the core actions of action, or the, parts of making an actions plan, just so that you can actually pull out all of the overwhelming information and start actually doing this. And this is great. You can choose a couple things every month to tackle. Um, great. So next, I'm sure you're feeling a little overwhelmed, but what we want to do now is introduce you to a farm, Be Well Farms, who were um, 
heavily affected by the nuns fire in 2017. This is Austin and Melissa of Be Well. Tonight we have, or this morning we have Austin here. Um, they are calling in from Glen Ellen. They lost almost everything they owned and they were in a pivotal time trying to expand their farm operations. But since then they've been able to keep the farm alive and decided to make some transitions um, to their enterprise as they grow their family. They were also contributors to our wildfire course. Um, so we're going to show, we're going to have Austin introduce himself, and then we're actually going to show you a media clip from our fires course, because that'll actually, we'll get to go to their farm and you'll see what this looks like in person. Um, and so I just really want to uh, welcome Austin. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy morning um, and share your experience with us. So if you would just tell us a little bit of who you are and um, what your experience has been with wildfires, we'll show a media clip and then we're going to come back to you, Austin, and ask you some questions. Katie, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Austin Laley, and uh, my wife and I run Be Well Farms, and we started it in 2015. Uh, neither one of us owns any land, so we do uh, all the ranches that we have are leased. Um, we started with just a couple acres of row crops and up to 1,000 laying hens and a pasture system, and uh, we run about 70 head of cattle right now. Uh, back in 2017, we had a massive learning curve uh, when we got hit in October by the Nuns Canyon fire. So the, the main ranch that we lease currently uh, backs up to Nuns Canyon. So when that fire started, it was on that ranch with wind speeds or something that kind of destroys what our idea of defensible space is completely. So um, in the 17 fires, we lost uh, the house, the truck, all of our hay storage, all of our uh, grain storage, um, the mule, legitimately pretty much everything. We were very lucky that uh, the animals actually did not uh, die. We had some on the property and some on a different ranch, uh, but we were very lucky to have as far as it was um it was a you know a very challenging time as you can imagine uh because it wasn't land that we own so after the fires we had to kind of make the decision to work with landowners to uh go through the process of helping rebuild it and rebuild the farm um during the fires my wife and i were able to stay the majority of the time in glen allen we went back in that way and then coming back in at like four o'clock in the morning, we happened to know some of the local fire department. So that happened for a couple of days till it became a little bit too difficult. And then we just hunkered down in Glen Ellen. And uh, as you can imagine, there's fire was still going. There was no water. Uh, there's no power. So there was no water on many of the ranches. Uh, but we were able to stay at an unburned house that was up the road from us. So, um, I mean, like, um, manage land, uh, our concept of uh, just defensible space, and then on top of that, just uh, what you actually do in the crisis, because it is completely blindsiding. Um, as you know, a lot of us probably know, a lot of us being in California who have had uh, different terrifying experiences. Um, so that's just a little kind of snapshot of my wife and I. We still are farming. Uh, we and all produce um there's been a again a steep learning curve and a, a lot of adjustments to the farm uh, but we're, we're still going and using a lot of different programs through the nrcs and different ways to manage land as you guys know that managing land is incredibly expensive and uh again it's a lot of this isn't our land so um working with landowners and different programs to kind of help uh, all those things. Thank you so much, Austin, for sharing some of your story. Um, and again, we'll come back to you in a second. So uh, for all the other participants, please uh, write down some questions to ask Austin because we're, we're so lucky to have him tonight. Um, we are actually going to share this media clip really quickly because we'll get to go to the site of where they farm in Glen Ellen um, and you'll meet Melissa, Austin's partner. 
and she is going to walk you through basically what they their emergency plan is and how that looks on their farm and how they're delegating it just to give you an idea of you know I think these things can be great in theory but actually what it looks like for other farmers so what we will do is kind of walk you through our wildfire emergency protocol so our personal home plan is number one because the first thing you need to do is get your home taken care of and your family and your pets and get your go kits and and leave the house if that is your plan. And so we are going to call 911, call tenants and landowners, I'm gonna let everybody know of the scenario, what's going on. We're going to load our pets into the cars for transportation to the arena, which will go over to the other side of the ranch in a little bit and I can explain where we are going to take those animals to. Um, we're going to gather all our go kits into personal vehicles, turn off all electrical devices to the buildings, and close windows and vents make sure the AC and heat is off. And that's in case when the power comes back on you prevent power surges which could cause wildfires or fires. And then we are going to move all personal vehicles to we have this big gravel pad that's surrounded by vineyards. It's a very safe spot. We had vehicles there during the last fire. They were all safe. Um, the vineyards have actually proven to be quite um, a great fire block. So that is where we've decided we're going to um, stage our vehicles at. And so now what we are going to do is we are going to head over to the other side of the ranch. And I'll go ahead and show you... Um, where it is that we plan to shelter in place because that is our plan and for both Atwood Ranch and for the farm we're sheltering in place and um, where we're going to bring our cattle to and then from there I could share a couple more resources with you guys and so I will meet you back over on the other side of the ranch. Hey there so here we are on the other side of the Atwood Ranch where it actually connects to Be Well Farms right through this gate here. So usually during fire season, this field is completely dead grass and dry. And we like to have our cattle in here during that time of year to keep the grass really very low and keep the space more defensible. Um, also, it's a great location to have them during this time of year because there's smaller pasture um, along closest to this side of the fence here. And what we're going to do if we need to, if we have a fire, is we're going to call the animals into these smaller pastures. And then they could be closer um, to us if we need to resort to plan uh, B to evacuate. Um, there's water hookups here. Um, we could keep a better eye on them. And it's a, um, a more defensible space with um, the grasses much lower. So that's our plan for the animals, is to bring them into these smaller fields here. Um, and we also have a 12 panel portable corral that um, if it does come to plan B to evacuate, we're going to set that up right in here and then use that to help load the animals onto the trailers. Um, we have a livestock trailer and um, also we have access to another large livestock trailer, so a couple options. Um, that we have to move them if we need to. Um, also on our emergency protocol, we have a couple places listed, which are places that we could take our animals if we do need to evacuate them. Um, so that's always a good thing to think about is just list your locations and resources that you have in order to evacuate animals too. Um, also, so what I'll go ahead and do now is just walk you through the rest of our action plan. And um, we have it broken up into tasks for each individual. So tasks for myself, tasks for Austin, and then things we'll both do together. So what I will do after we load um, our vehicles, get everything to a safe spot, stage our vehicles where they're supposed to be, um, I'm going to contact all the neighbors about the potential threats, keep the team current on what's going on in, with the emergency, and maintain a visual on the smoke and fire location. Austin is going to go around the ranch and make sure all the gates are open on the perimeter of the 
ranch and this will allow the first responders to enter um, and have good access so they don't ruin gates or have to bulldoze through fence lines. Next, he's going to notify first responders of the animals that we have on property so they know um, just what's here, what to look for, and hopefully can keep fence lines intact in those areas. Um, next, move tractors, trucks, and equipment to the middle of field one, which is a cultivated and irrigated area. So that's referring to our farm vehicles and tractor. And um, field one is the area where we have our garden. Um, it's a one acre plot. It's fenced in, and because it's cultivated and irrigated, it's actually a, a good fire break area and a good defensible space. It did not burn during the last fire, but it burned all around it. So we decided that would be a safe place to put our farm vehicles. Next, he's gonna hook up the generator to the well to keep water running. So we're thankful to have generators for both our farm and for the Atwood Ranch. So when we need it or when the power is out, we could hook those up to the wells and keep water coming for our livestock and for ourselves. Next, um, together, we, Austin and I are gonna move our cattle to Safe Zone 1, which is what we've named these smaller, lower pastures here that are right along the fence between Atwood Ranch and our farm. Um, and we're going to prep all the waterers for this area. So there's a hose spigot over there as well as right down here. Um, and we use a water trough with a float so we can have that constantly full. And since it's so close, it's easy to keep an eye on. Um, and then we're going to prepare to shelter in place. We're going to contact the halter program to help facilitate transportation in case of an emergency. Um, but our plan A is to shelter in place here. Um, plan B is to move the cattle into the arena, which is another safe area with even more defensible space around it. I'll show you that in just a second. And plan C actually is to, um, to transport animals to another facility or evacuate the livestock. Um, so here I will show you um, our facilities. So here's the fence where the Be Well pasture meets the Atwood Ranch. Here is the Atwood Ranch here. And this is the barn that we are planning on sheltering in place in. There are fire extinguisher or fire um, hose hookups there and one on the far side of the barn as well. And this has a lot of gravel around it, big defensible spaces. Um, and during the last fire, that was actually stayed and fought off the fire from this area. And it was very defensible and easy to do that from this spot. So this is a safe place. So we've decided we are all gonna shelter in place at. Now you could see down here, this is the horse arena. Um, and it's half covered, half not, but it's a big sandy area, um, hard fenced all the way around. Thank you so much, Melissa, for making that video for us. Um, and we're going to go back to Austin. I hope that was helpful just to get to see things um, in person, what it would look like on a farm. So Austin, could you just, um, so now I'm going to open this up to all participants. If you want to talk to Austin about any of your questions, what it's like to go through fire, what their preparednesses are like. Um, but Austin, we're so happy to have us. Can you tell just a little bit about how your, um, how those emergency plans have helped you all, if you've had to use them, any changes you've made. Absolutely. Um, you know, having that backbone of a plan is essential and getting to know all your neighbors and being very open and familiar with them because a 500 acre piece of property is awesome. But if you can connect three of them together, then you have a lot more land and a lot more resources because everybody else has got tractors, equipment, and they can lend a hand and help out. Um, that plan is ex uh, very, very, very important for us. What we're uh, two ranches, which is uh, they're connecting ranches. Uh, we lease one and then uh, we get to run cattle on the other one for free. 
Um, and we also have a couple more ranches in the valley and those are a little bit more remote. And so what we've done is just worked with the landowners and made sure that we can take the cows and put them into vineyard blocks that are completely fenced that have been disc in the rows. So we have kind of satellite safety zones that are very, very accessible. So, um, you know, cause not all the animals are here all of the time. And, uh, you know, one big thing I keep saying is that it's so important to start taking advantage of winter. I know for farmers and ranchers, uh, winter is kind of the quiet time, but if you have the ability to run a chainsaw and have a friend that can help you, um, burn piles are incredibly full fuel, um, you know, managing all the trees, all the down trees, you can make fires everywhere on the hillside on a nice rainy day and you don't have to drag brush very far. Uh, we've been doing that for the last three or four years across almost all of these properties, just kind of cleaning it up. Uh, as you can imagine, we live in wine country, so uh, there's a lot of focus specifically around vineyards. So all these old ranches kind of got overgrown as livestock pulled on for the year. So going back and cleaning up some of those hillsides and um, kind of making everything quite a bit more defensible. So fire tends to walk instead of getting the canopies and start running. So, I mean, taking advantage of winter is one thing that has kind of revolutionized how we think of defending ourselves from fires. Start now, you know, and then be protected going into fire season. Thank you, Austin. So important and a good reminder of the community of just using each other's resources as well and overlapping and having redundancy there. Um, I see Muriel, you had a couple questions while the video was going. Would you like to just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask them to Austin? Well, not, not so much a question, but, um, you know, um, biochar has a lot of potential and in using that kind of fire to reduce the fuel load could be a win-win situation. Um. Great, thanks. So, yeah, biochar is a big one that people are exploring. Um, Austin, I saw some questions mm -hmm. about wa water storage and, and generators. Could you speak a little bit about that? I think specifically, um, uh, um, no, I think specifically Meryl was asking about what horsepower generator you, you use. Just, just idle curiosity. Um, you know, depending on how much power is really necessary to move water around. I don't know about you know different um, technologies for for access and stuff like that. Um, and it's probably you're using a, a gas generator or a diesel generator. But I guess lots of people use it gas. Depends on the, it, you know what? It depends on the ranch. Um, on one of the ranches we have a large tow behind diesel generator um, and it has enough power to actually power the majority of the facilities and the well itself some of the other bigger gas power generator but i would recommend just calling your well company and your well company will give you an idea on the horsepower of your pump and that'll kind of give you an idea on what you actually need for power from your generator. And then always use an electrician if you're gonna try and hardwire it together. So you actually have some, but uh, use the professionals around you that, you know, your, your well company and an electrician is pretty much all you need to get the right. Um, has it gotten easier to get a permit to build a pond? Cause that might help too. There is water storage uh, throughout the majority of these ranches. There is water storage uh, that are ponds. Some of them are fenced in, some of them aren't, but a lot of them are surrounded by the actual pasture land. Uh, so they're not necessarily, I wouldn't turn animals out to the ponds unless uh, it was really, really bad. I think thirsty and dehydrated, um, but making sure they can make it through the night. You know, our experiences with 17, I think 19, 20 fires, all were right here in this area. And one of them burned on, in 2020, uh, three miles up the road from us. They turned off our power for 
uh, almost 10 straight days. So, um, and we had cattle literally right up to that line. And, uh, you know, kind of knowing how far you can push the situation, when to kind of react. You don't just want to load your animals in a trailer and send them off, you know, two weeks early if you don't have to, because that's another problem. And if you leave your ranch, it's very, very challenging to get back on. So if it's a safe environment and you feel comfortable doing so, it, it is very, it has been very helpful for us to stay on the property. Um, catastrophic events that we had. I, I got a good one for you. In the 2020 fires, uh, we had two trucks with two large trailers hold, um, getting ready to go grab cow calves from Bennett Valley, which are about 20 minute drive from the main ranch and bring them to the main ranch. And my wife's water actually broke at the house in the evacuation zone. So uh, I, we, I asked her, said we drove hours hauling everything getting it done and then i got her we went to the hospital and we had our first child and then uh, i spent the next 10 days we had to stay at my sister's house in sonoma and i just was able to sneak in every single day for almost the entire day and then go back to the house at night so i mean there's a lot of situations you really can't um predict but uh, just kind of having some sort of plan, some sort of outside because you need people to bring you supplies a lot of the time and they'll let you meet with them at the border of the kind of um, safe zones and gather supplies so you can go in and out because you do run a little bit low on food and water and energy, so, and gas and diesel. <laughs> Wow, Austin, I hadn't heard that part of the story. That's a serious like California wildfire <laughs> farmer story. Thank you for that. And again, just really hitting home that any, yeah, like having any type of plan ahead of time is so important because so many other unpredictable things will happen. So um, having some some sort of strategy at the beginning to help you navigate when things are um, not literally on fire. Uh, I'm going to go to Karen and then Mitch. I see your hands are up. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I just want to comment. I heard Austin talk about opening gates uh, so that emergency crews can have access and stuff. I would highly recommend to everybody if you have a locked gate, get a hold of your local sheriff's department. They have some kind of program, most likely, where you share your gate code and any other pertinent information like you can share if you've got water storage and where it is and how much it is um, so that the sheriff's department can get onto your property if you have evacuated. It's really important and it's confidential, but it allows first responders to get in because um, so many of us, our properties are pretty remote and we've got locked gates. So I just, you know, definitely reach out and find out if your sheriff's department has a program like that. Yeah, and Thank Karen, you, you so can much. do knox boxes, which are you working with the local fire department as well, and they'll have access to the gates. Most of the time, though, if they're coming, they're going to go right through that gate. You know, <laughs> they, they have uh, bolt cutters yeah. and everything. So it's just one more, especially if you have a fancy gate, like an electric gate, they're just not even going to play with it. They're going to open it. <laughs> yeah. One thing we did learn, though, is the sheriff's department, believe it or not, in Sonoma County, doesn't have access to Knox boxes. Yeah, that's it's, true, yeah. it's a it's it's a real disconnect with emergency personnel. But yeah, definitely have a Knox box, which is fire access, and then let the sheriff's office know. And and it could be for fire, but it also could be for emergencies. You know, if you've and I've recently had to deal with you know having an ambulance come, and um, you know if the sheriff had the gate code, I would. You know, I wasn't worried about them getting in and not breaking my gate. So awesome. Thanks. I love these practical tips um, for sharing. Thank you so much, Karen and Austin. Um, Mitch, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to uh, touch on a couple topics. You know, one thing Austin had mentioned was uh, was the, the burn piles and stuff. And, you know, we, we've had our cattle range since the uh, mid 60s. And, and uh, and honestly, over the years, that's that's been the source of uh, grassland fires on our property was from uh, was from old burn piles that we've had, mm -hmm. and uh, and we had one fire that I remember in particular that 
that uh, we were clearing an area out with a bulldozer and and started the 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 fire of of uh, of that trash, and it was three years later where the fire the conditions were correct and the fire lit back up from a root that was smoldering for all that time. So so you know it's a great it's a great source of uh, of uh, you know using up that fuel or or getting rid of some of that that fuel but it can be dangerous too and and some uh and some follow-up with that the other thing i wanted to mention was uh you know i've been a general contractor for and uh there's some really really wonderful products out there now that uh that you can go and and put uh generator systems into electrical systems um it's a great source to be able to go and have a, a way of hooking up a generator to a well, but that's that's some um, some structure, that's some some work that needs to be done by the homeowner or the pump owner uh, beforehand, and that can be um, pretty inexpensively set up where you can hook a, a generator up into a into a panel box and and turn off the the, the landline AC power and be able to connect to generator power too. And that's a great footwork for, uh, for us to go and do. And, and a lot of us are using uh, uh, solar panel systems for pumps too. And, and solar is a very, very easy thing to go and plug a, uh, a uh, generator system into with just a small amount of work. You know, solar doesn't work if, it's, uh, if there's a bunch of, uh, of smoke around, you know, so that the, the usefulness of those panels goes way down because the, the panels are all covered with ash and there is no sunlight getting through. So in the case of a, of a large wildfire, your, your solar powered pumps don't work anymore. Wow, thank you for sharing all of that, Mitch. Um, so helpful and useful and, and feel free to keep sharing tips in the chat as well. Um, we're gonna go to Natalia in a second, but before we do that, um, and Natalia is gonna go through some the next steps on your farm uh, for preparedness, but Austin, really quickly, could you talk a little bit about how insurance played out for you all um, when when the fire came and what happened after and how, what you have now and kind of the successes and pitfalls and in a short you know three minute <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah right. you know <laughs> my wife and i were first generation ranching and farming uh so this isn't something in our background so when we started our business uh, we did an insurance policy that was to say the least skimpy and we acquired a lot more stuff through the years as we've been farming um, but our insurance policy was not really, uh, it, it didn't cover much at all. And so I would definitely suggest that, um, you know, as you are starting a farm or running a farm, that you're making sure that you have your marine policy for your UTVs, you have uh, everything covered. I mean, because um, you really just kind of can't begin to understand when you're trying to make this list of everything that you lost uh, and then trying to prove it to the insurance company. So uh, invest a little bit more into the insurance protecting uh, any of your tools, your assets, anything like that. And um, so before the fire, uh, we, we got hurt pretty bad by having almost uh, they're very, very, very little coverage. After the fire, we've beefed it up. We spent a little bit money, more money on our, uh, um, you know, premiums and everything like that. We document everything. We take pictures, uh, make sure that we can justify um, in a very small amount of time uh, what we had, where it is, and then also keeping everything current. Um, so, I mean, if you have a couple of different properties that, you know, each one of those properties, you know, you're additionally assured there and uh, all the different components to, to um, you know, insurance is supposed to be for us, but sometimes it doesn't really feel like they are working for us. So just make sure you're covering uh, your own, you know what, <laughs> before there's a problem. So I definitely, again, say pictures and documentation of everything you own. It's very, very important. Awesome. Thank you so much, Austin. And this is something we're actually, we're going to be producing materials for farmers over the next year on financial preparedness, including insurance. And there's 
so much to know and pitfalls and successes and all those things. Um, I'm seeing Amber just going through and taking a video of your, of um, like your workshop, for instance, um, as well as putting important documents onto the cloud are really um, key things to do that don't take very long. And then you can have a more sophisticated spreadsheet later. Um, we're gonna hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for some more Q and A, but um, I really wanna make sure we get to this next session from Natalia, who's gonna go through some um, next steps as well as some resources that are available for you all. And thank you, Austin, so much for sharing all of your expertise, yes. hopefully. And please keep putting, if you have more questions or tips, use the chat, put them in there, and I will be sending a follow-up email with all of that, and I can answer questions that way too. All right, thank you, Austin and Melissa for your work. And now we'll look at what can you do on your farm? Let's look at some key actions that you can take to be more prepared. Obviously, if you haven't done this yet, create defensible space every year around your home and farm infrastructure. And if you can, it's expensive, but try to harden your home and your infrastructure against oncoming embers. You'll um, Obviously, you'll, you'll want to reduce fuel load in your surrounding forests and grasslands through thinning, pruning, and grazing. And you'll want to practice emergency response with your whole crew and backup personnel. And we can't underemphasize this. Who will take care of what? When? How will you communicate? Where will your animals go? How will you save your crops? Practice that emergency response so that you can really reduce the stress during an emergency and you can reduce your potential losses during a fire. As part of that, you'll wanna set up and test your backup systems like we've been talking about in the chat. In the event of an electrical outage, make sure that your generators work with your cooling systems, your irrigation and whatever you need to keep the farm running. You really gotta test them and um, make sure they can run for at least a week if there's a power outage and make sure you have water and that you can get water to your crops and your livestock. Make your farm wildfire ready and reduce your infrastructure vulnerability by starting to look at your piping, your irrigation, your fencing, whether it can withstand high heat and winds. We have a comprehensive list of what to look for to increase the readiness of your farm in chapter three of that workbook that you downloaded. And we've collected this list from farmers who have told us what they've lost and what they've experienced. As we've been sharing in the chat, make sure you get an, an ag pass if you can, as it gives you access to your farm during a disaster when others have to evacuate if it's available in your region. Um, also get your infrastructure and crop insurance and understand exactly what is covered in the, in the event of a fire. Don't just assume that it's covered. And we've heard that it's helpful to have an agent visit your land. Uh, I know this can be a really difficult one for small and diversified farms since insurance isn't really designed for us. Um, we will have some insurance training and resources coming up, so stay tuned. And finally, if you wanna take your comfort with fire to the next level, you could join the prescribed burning training through Trex. Also, OSU just released a fire suppression training for farmers uh, online, which is backed up by OSHA in Oregon. And I say this with caution because first and foremost, you really want to protect your life. Obviously, we want you to protect your life. But in recent wildfires, firefighting resources have been stretched so thin that some agricultural regions that have been left behind to fend for themselves so having real fire skills can really help you and your community. And at the very least, find out who has firefighting training in your neighborhood and connect with them. That takes us to the next step, which is thinking about your community. So what can you do in your community? First and foremost, work with your neighbors on fuel load reduction, evacuation, response planning, all the things. It's not always easy because neighbors don't necessarily agree, uh, but know who in your neighborhood has the emergency skills and establish a mutual aid network in your community and neighborhood. Link up with local agencies, such as the NRCS, which provide fund, funds for preparedness and recovery, and with local organizations and organizers who frequently serve as the, the spoke uh, in the wheel during an emergency response. If you have those links beforehand, it makes it so much easier during the emergency. And as folks have been sharing in the, in the chat, you could join forces with your local fire safe council if one exists, or you could create one if one doesn't. Um, fire safe councils are grassroots community led organizations that work together to protect the residents of a community from catastrophic fires. And they're also eligible, uniquely eligible for funding to help neighbors and residents reduce risk. As we heard Karen sharing the chat. 
join or create a fire adaptive communities network in your region if you can. There's heaps of resources for these types of um, networks and you can really work together to collaboratively plan how to coexist with wildfire. And finally, review and understand your local government community wildfire protection plan. It's a mouthful. These are plans that are created by community members, fire agencies, and local governments. They are really a great opportunity to influence where and how agencies will implement fuel reduction and even how federal funds are distributed on private land. So if you join up with your local government's fire protection planning group, you might be able to have some influence there. So we want to leave you with some resources because we understand that everything we shared is a lot and you might be able to only do one or a few of the things that we've shared today, which is, is you know, it's okay. We can only do what we can. And it takes a lot of money and time to do this. So there are some financial resources to help you. And we've seen uh, farmers really lean on the NRCS, which can provide technical assistance and financial aid for reducing fuel loads and forest uh, management and prescribed grazing. If you connect with them and, and get on their database before a fire, it's much easier to get their support after one. Also, you can check your local RCD, which sometimes has funds for fuel reduction activities, as well as with your county or town to see what resources they have. For example, Marin has a defensible space and home hardening fund that people can apply to. Check with your fire department to see if they do a property evaluation. Some fire districts actually have grant programs to help you after they've come to your farm to see what your property is like, then they can help you create that defensible space if they have those funds available. And you can also check with your fire safe council to see what programs they have for you. And there's um, also a series of Cal, Cal Fire grants, which are bigger, and they support fuel reductions for private uh, forest landowners as well as they help you implement a forest management plan if you have forest. So a lot of other resources for recovery after a fire. We really just focus on the resources for before a fire, including insurance and the FSA. And we'll cover those in future webinars. We also go into those in our online course. So with that, I would like to just pause here and thank you for taking this time this morning. Oh, actually, we, and, and I'm going to share with you a link to our course, which I think we already did, but I want to make sure that you have it. And keep an eye out. We're going to have a workshop series in the fall and winter. And I'm going to share a, a poll with you. So we're, we're wrapping up. We'll, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A, so don't, don't jump off too quickly. Um, we're going to share a poll with you really quickly. We'd love you to fill out. It's part of um, us understanding if we're being effective as well as being able to secure funds in the future to be able to keep doing this to see how we're actually doing. So if you would take a second and fill out this poll um, once it pops up. Um, and then I would love to uh, turn back to all of you and, and have a little bit of a conversation for those that can stay on. Um, and again, yes. what'd you say, Natalia? I said we still have seven more minutes, so I didn't, I didn't yes. need to wrap things up quite so quickly, but <laughs> here's, oh, sorry. Here's um, a few of our resources and thank you. So the resources being our, our online course is, is self-paced and you can join it whenever. And we'll be doing more of a cohort one this winter if you wanna join as part of a whole group. And the point of that then is will be to be led through the whole workbook leading you to have a full resilience plan. So um, if you're interested in doing that, um, you can either sign up now or in the winter um, and that's available for you as well as I'll be sharing all the resources from CAF. Um, Natalia, did you send the poll out? I did. Okay, great. Um, so now we have about five, five, six minutes um, for if I'm going to let you all ask questions here. Otherwise, I'm going to prompt a question. Does anybody have any burning questions or experiences that you want to share? Comments? Zach, please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to actually uh, tie into what was just. Uh, uh, on the screen there about those grants. Um, I'm not sure, I think some people probably know and and, uh, and we've kind of gone through it a little bit, but the Firewise Councils, 
uh, once they're off the ground and running, um, have the ability to apply for lots and lots of money uh, through through grants, at least here in California. Um, and they don't, they're not required to have the acreage um, that were on that slideshow there if it's done through a firewise council. If a private a private landowner is applying for a grant themselves, there's acreage minimums, but the uh, the firewise councils have a lot more leeway. Um, and so a, a community of a bunch of a bunch of smaller landowners can get together and do a firewise council, even you know at the county level or even in a, a local region, even a community themselves can start their own firewise council. Um, there are a few hoops to jump through in terms of 501c3s and that kind of stuff, um, but then they have access to um, a lot of money through the state programs uh, in, in, in grant forms. So uh, a, a little bit to go on if uh, uh, it's, it's it's from what I've seen, kind of the best way to get funding for smaller ranches, smaller farmers who, you know, on their own, there's not really a, a, a great avenue to get that financially paid for or even the possibility. So um, the pre prescribed burn associations uh, that Trex power uh, Trex bullet point on the PowerPoint, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, those are less formal uh, range improvement associations or prescribed burn associations are less formal, um, but still uh, recognized through the state. And there are some funding avenues for those for those organizations as well, just less them. Those are more of a cooperation based, um, but there's a, a ton of training resources directed just towards those, those programs. Hope it helps. Awesome. That's Thank really you. Really helpful, Zach. Thank you. I've been uh, I've been wondering, and maybe you know this or someone else. But I think Karen said she was part of a fire council uh, and was able to receive funds. How how difficult is it for growers to apply for those Cal Fire funds if they're part of a fire council? Like how much work? Because some of some of the grants that we've had growers apply for are just so difficult that they're not even worth applying sometimes, especially if you're on your own. So what have you seen in terms of accessibility? Um, the, the Fire Safe Council has to be up and running uh, and active, you know, and, and have the, the nonprofit, the 501c3 in place um, to really have a great shot at doing it. Um, but once that's in place, um, there's still, it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of state finances that, and hoops that have to get jumped through. But once that Fire Safe Council is in place, it does become much easier. And working with, you know, I mean, in the, the, the folks on here from Sonoma County, um, you know, the Cal Fire and the Sonoma County resources over in that area are are uh, pretty in tune and usually things get pushed through fairly well. Uh, but it depends on the relationship with uh, the state resources, the county resources, the local fire jurisdictions um, to all work together to get those things pushed through. But uh, there there is since, you know, about 2015. In California, at least, there's been significant augmentation of funds, and almost all that go directly to grants. Um, and and so there, the money is out there. And and a single person on their own, if you haven't written a grant before, it, it's mm -hmm. you know it's not something that and everyone knows how to do. But if you find someone who can do that for a community, or I mean, it's even you know if if the grant you're going for is is worth enough, it's worth paying the money up front to have someone who actually knows how to write a grant, write that grant. Um, but it, it's not it's not difficult, but the, the correct hoops do have to be jumped through, unfortunately. I wish it was easier. Thank you, Zach, for sharing all that. Karen, you have a question? Yeah, I was gonna say the um, we have our fire safe council is really just a few of us in the neighborhood. We have a, another nonprofit that already existed in the neighborhood. So we kind of did our fire safe council under that umbrella. So that worked easily. And then I would highly recommend getting in touch with like your local RCD, our Sonoma RCD group is very experienced in grants. And so we partnered with them. They did the heavy lifting on the grant writing and we did the heavy lifting on engaging the neighborhood and getting homeowner approvals. And that was really the keys to success to getting our grant. Um, it was funded by pg e because of the fires in Sonoma County. So we do have a pretty big funding opportunity with pg e specifically, but um, we got, a, our first grant was a half a million dollars to do defensible space in our neighborhood. And it covered 55 homes in our immediate neighborhood. So partner with existing 
uh, folks that are experienced with grant writing, and I would look at RCDs as your first stop because they're they would probably love to help be an administrator for a grant. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. That's super helpful, and I've been impressed hearing about what your community has done. Um, we can stay on in a little bit later if people still want to talk and have questions, but I want to wrap up since we're at time. And I want to thank uh, Austin and BeWell. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also really want to thank our funders from RMA. Um, Catherine um, Anderson was on the call from, from that agency. Um, we're so grateful to have the funding to do this. And thank you to all of you. As you can see, we learned so much from just other participants in here. So uh, we really believe in farmer to farmer education. So if you have stories to share, resources, tips, please email us, get in touch with us. We might even feature you on a podcast um, of your fire story or we'll include anything you share with us um, in the follow-up emails as well as in our network. And as you can see, there's a lot happening um, trying to keep people in touch. Um, just trying to gain momentum and power through a community. And that's something that we're doing a lot with CAF. Um, please stay in touch if you want to be a part of that. Join our course. Um, that, that way you'll be part of a network too and, and get updates. And again, we'll be doing a workshop series through the whole year. So um, stay tuned for more. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy mornings to be with us. We learned so much. Um, really grateful for all the work you do. Um, feel free to stay on if you want to ask more questions um, for the rest of you are going to leave. Thank you so much for being here. I hope it was um, useful for everyone.